Since the folks who watch me on YouTube seem to be giant fans of maps, I thought I would take some time today and color code one, my opinion, of how things would end up playing out if there would be a shooting war that would start down in Venezuela. Or Colombia, wherever. Now, let me explain the codes real quick. The red and black stands for blood and oil whomever might be in charge. The purple is Venezuela and those who would stand with Venezuela. I used that color simply because it shows up better on the map. The ones that you see in green and red are wild cards or, to my mind, possibly just irrelevant in the entire discussion. So... Anyway, uh, pretty straightforward on a lot of this. Of course, we have the U.S. and Canada, and then Colombia, Panama. Over here, Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana. These have all been well under the thumb of the United States, and we've established very recently in videos that U.S. Special Forces have been doing operations in these regions. So to say that they would not uh, be a platform for launching into Venezuela, I think, uh, would be misinformed. The Brazilians are going to be a giant factor in something like this, primarily because they're the largest, second largest military in the Western Hemisphere. Believe it or not, there's the United States, there's Brazil, there's uh, Canada and Mexico, and then everybody else behind that. The reason I have them in purple, I had them in green for a while as a wild card, but the more I think about it, the way things are going with Lula da Silva, this guy they have in prison that they want... Uh, to be president down there. If you read some of the articles and some of the information coming out of that region, they are staunchly behind their nationalist movement down there, their anti-U.S., anti-big oil, anti-globalist movement. Ecuador has already come out and um, stood in support of Mr. Maduro. Um, no surprise, I think, that uh, Obrador in Mexico would back him up. Cuba would back him up. Honduras, Nicaragua, um, Guatemala, after the way that we've treated their people, I cannot see them um, backing any kind of an invasion plan. Bolivia, of course, very firmly behind Mr. Maduro. Argentina and Chile, not giant fans of Maduro, but even less fans of the IMF, the UN, the globalist, all they see, all that us coming out of the United States. So that's why I have them there. Paraguay, Uruguay, probably not relevant. And Peru. Vizcarra is a tough one. Um, Vizcarra was uh, Kaczynski's vice president. And when Trump went down and met with those four leaders earlier this spring, all four of them told him to go fly a kite when he was talking about invading Venezuela. And that was Peru and Panama and um, Colombia, and one other country I can't think of right now, but Brazil. And all of them told them, said no. But we're still going to leave it in kind of an unknown category just because I'm not sure where he's going to play out in all this. Um, now, anywhere outside the hemisphere is going to be more than likely fairly irrelevant, but I color-coded what I could just to show where the U.S. has made major inroads, like through Africa here. Um, these countries here, of course, if they were forced to have a position, would side with the United States. The rest more than likely wouldn't. Um, places like Madagascar and Australia, uh, irrelevant, I think. India is a tough one because India is just switching over from Venezuelan oil to U.S. oil, but the biggest thing they want is not an interruption in flow. So how they would play out on this would be strange um, or hard to predict. Of course, the Japanese would back us up. Um, all through this part of Asia, though, all the way through Russia, Eastern Europe, very clearly has made no bones about the fact that they would uh, not be um, for any U.S. intervention anywhere else other than we already have. Up here, um, Germany, this is all the EU, of course, and of the islands just to the north of here are Dutch, so the Netherlands, of course, would be on the side of the United States. But 
this would be what we would be facing if we were going to try to do this. We would not have the kind of support you would think that you would need to go into a country of this size, 30 million people, founding member of OPEC. We are still importing oil from Venezuela on a daily basis. Um, any That's the one big lie they're not telling you that even there's no, they can threaten sanctions all they want. The U.S. does not have the ability to replace the oil we import from Venezuela. And here's the one of the funniest things I don't think a lot of people understand. It's kind of a cognitive dissonance moment. Our number one supplier of oil is Canada, a socialist country. Our number two supplier of oil is Saudi Arabia, a theocracy, monarchical theocracy. Number three supplier of oil is Mexico. Another, what we would call, I suppose they're of all of these countries, they would be the least socialist. But with their new leader, they're heading that way real quick. And number four, believe it or not, to this day, is Venezuela, supplier of oil. We also import oil from Russia. So of all of those, all of those countries, three for sure socialist, one heading socialist, and one monarchy. None of them are constitutional republics. So it's kind of a strange thing that the U.S., if it wanted to be energy independent, if the U.S. really wanted to be energy independent, what they would have to do is say this. Oil companies, all big U.S. oil companies, the first place you sell oil is to the United States. And when we finally have all of our needs met, then you can export oil. That would turn us into a socialist, government-run country by dictating to private business who they could and who they could not sell to. It's a hard thing to wrap your mind around, isn't it? That if you're going to take over an industry so that your country maintains a level of energy independence that you've so sought for for so long, you would need to adopt policies that would make you seem as if you were a socialist country by controlling your oil industry. Like the Venezuelans do. Like the Saudis do. Ecuador. All these big countries. Russia. So, I guess that's just going to be something the U.S. people are going to have to sit down and have a discussion about. Whether we're going to let U.S. oil companies dictate who we go to war with, who we don't go to war with, who we invade, who we don't invade. And whether we're going to say that uh, independence and profit for a business overrides national security and the well-being of the American people. And I think this map shows this clearly, what the U.S. priorities have been, at least up until this point. And if we're going to have a change in priorities, maybe looking at this map by be a good place to start. Because the idea that we're even talking about or that we've had a leader even discuss invading a country that has literally never threatened anyone, ever. They have had a war raging in the country right next to them for 60 years, basically because of the U.S. policy down there, half a billion dollars a year in aid and monkeying around with the politics. And Venezuela has never once threatened that country. They've never threatened Brazil. And believe me, at one time, they could have. They were the wealthiest country down there by far. And their military is no joke. If they really were this evil, horrible, terrible, uh, dictator-run country, you would think by now there would have been some documentation of a threat to their neighbors. We've threatened more people than they have. Colombia's threatened more people than they have. You should see the crap that they've had, that they've dealt with with Ecuador and Peru over the years. And all the times that they've gotten into nose-to-nose over stupid crap. Venezuela? No. And here we are talking about invading them. So, 
Anyway, we will leave it there. I'll let you guys discuss it. Like, share, subscribe.